I'm going to have an amendment at the desk. Reserve point of order. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 277 offered by Mr. Nath. Without objection, the amendment we consider is read. The gentleman from New York is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I won't take five minutes. Mr. Chairman, my amendment would exempt rules made by the Environmental Protection Agency from the approval requirements of the RAINS Act. As I noted in my opening statement, the RAINS Act would stall the work of government by requiring both chambers of commerce to vote to approve and the president to sign any rule being considered by the executive branch. This amendment would exempt the vital rules promulgated by the Environmental Protection Agency. The EPA ensures that the air we breathe is clean and free of dangerous pollutants. By one estimate, estimate the EPA's regulatory enforcement of the Clean Air Act has prevented over 200,000 early deaths. Access to safe drinking water is a basic human right and we rely on the experts at the EPA to make sure that our water is free of toxic pesticides and harmful chemicals like lead, mercury, and arsenic. It issues regulations to protect our communities from chemical spills and contaminated sites. It protects us from the ravages of climate change. But supporters of this bill want to hamstring the EPA and undermine its ability to issue vital regulations to keep our water safe and our air safe, our water safe to drink and our air safe to breathe. My amendment would ensure that while this bill may grind to a halt other agency rulemaking, at least the EPA would be able to continue its critical work of protecting our health and safety. I yes, that my colleagues support the amendment. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields. Uh, the gentleman with withdraws his point of order. Gentlewoman uh, from uh, Wyoming, Ms. Hagman, is uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I oppose this amendment. Um, there is no reason to carve out certain types of rules from the requirements of the RAINS Act. Congress remains free to regulate in a very detailed way without these carve-outs, and so, do, so too do administrative agencies. The RAINS Act already contains exceptions for emergencies, national security, enforcement of criminal laws, and implementation of trade agreements. Other major rules are appropriately subject to Congress's consideration and approval before they go into effect. And the fact is that these sorts of issues may be significant, makes it all the more important that Congress consider and approve them before they can take effect. I urge my colleagues to oppose the amendment, and I yield back. Will the gentlelady yield? Yes. Um, I would just add a couple notes in regards to this. I can give you an example over the EPA um, initiated rulemaking. It was a little over a decade ago, and there was a local paper mill in my district that built a, uh, it was about a 10 to $15 million smokestack as a result of that administrative rule that had been put in place. The uh, person and head of environmental compliance at that paper mill, I asked them, uh, how much benefit did the environment get from that? Zero, nothing. They had to build the uh, smokestack because of an edict from the EPA. The EPA did not study whether it would actually do environmental good. It, has, it did none then. It continues to do none. But you can see that smokestack yet today. So think about what was displaced as a result of that. They spent about 10 to $15 million. So employees didn't get some raises that they might have been able to get. There might have been other environmental improvements that the company could have made with that 10 to $15 million. Those were sidelined, as well as safety improvements at the plant were sidelined as a result of having to take a finite amount of capital, in this case, 10 to $15 million, and to spend it on something that does not work. And I would say to you, we also have um, a rule that uh, was attempted to pass as a law, our former home state uh, Senator uh, Feingold tried to pass the waters of the United States. He authored that bill almost 20 years ago. And that bill has never been able to make it through the Congress of the United States. But the agencies have been trying to pass it as a rule. In fact, we just did a CRA on it, I believe. Waters of the United States which would regulate every single drop of water here in our country, where every state across the country has their own EPA. In my state, we call it the Department of Natural Resources, that do those type of regulatory things.
So here you had the waters of the United States, which could not pass through the United States Congress at the will of the people. It gets done via regulatory fiat by the agencies. Those are just a couple of practical examples of why this is not a good idea. Um, uh, first of all, why the bill is a good idea, the RAINS Act, but it's a really bad idea to carve out agencies which will continue to act with impunity. I yield back to the gentlewoman, gentlewoman from Wyoming. And I would provide additional examples that the EPA is probably one of the most abusive agencies in terms of attempting to expand its authority and the definitions and the statutory framework under which it is to act. The Clean Water Act is just one example of that with the effort over the last couple of many years uh, with the EPA attempting to expand what is defined as a navigable water of the United States by redefining what is, uh, what, what, what is meant by that phrase. Uh, again, attempting to define an irrigation ditch as a navigable water of the United States. Uh, the, the, the EPA has repeatedly been informed that they are exceeding their authority in their efforts to do that as well as under the Clean Water Act. So the one agency that is probably with one, uh, one of the most abusive in terms of ignoring the statutory framework and proceeding with regulations is the EPA. What's significant about that is in attempting to take control over all water in the United States, not just navigable waterways as defined in the statute, or in their effort to expand what the Clean Air Act says, uh, the regulations that they are adopting literally have uh, impacts of not 50 million, not 100 million, but hundreds of millions and billions and even trillions of dollars of impacts on our economy with these regulations. If there was any agency that should be reined in by the RAINS Act, it is the EPA. And it's not because Republicans want dirty air or dirty water, it's that we want the agencies to comply with the statutes and the EPA consistently does not. With that, I yield back. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, this should not be an argument confined to whether or not the EPA has been abusive in its definition of whether or not a particular body of water is a navigable water or not, especially when you have uh, the health and safety of people at stake that the EPA addresses. For instance, um, and I would venture to suspect that not many members of Congress know much about PFAS, P-F-A-S, but uh, the EPA is in the uh, process of uh, promulgating a rule that will protect our clean, will, our drinking water, to, will help make it clean by uh, banning uh, certain substances from being in our water. And those substances are polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS. Uh, the proposed PFAS National Primary Drinking Water Regulation which was announced on March 14th of 2023, proposed uh, that uh, six PFAS, including perfluoroactinic acid and other substances, six of them, commonly known as Gen X chemicals, um, that um, these substances be uh, monitored and banned from our drinking water to protect Americans. And the reason why the EPA exists is to protect the health, safety, and well-being of Americans, not to determine whether or not a particular body of water is navigable, even though they do do that. But their primary mission is to protect uh, the uh, health and safety of Americans. That's what they are in the process of doing with this new PFAS rule. And that's why I support this uh, amendment, uh, because it will exempt uh, the EPA uh, from the provisions of the underlying bill. Uh, the EPA, as I have stated, uh, exists to protect our health, safety, and well-being. And I suspect why 
we keep using the EPA as an example of administrative overreach is because that is the agency that is a pain in the butt to the Koch brothers and other fossil fuel um, interests, corporate interests that fuel uh, the dark money that runs uh, these campaigns that elect those who support their policies. And so if they want to get elected, they've got to go with uh, the dark money. And the dark money is Koch brothers and others. Uh, they tend to foul up our environment in the pursuit of corporate profits. Uh, they don't care about tomorrow. They don't care about climate uh, change. They don't care about environmental protection. All they care about is profits. And so this underlying legislation rewards uh, those who would foul up our environment with the ability to do so unencumbered by regulation. We need these regulations to, to uh, protect us. I mean, just, uh, we're just reading about how the FDA being undermanned uh, is trying to now um, uh, get at this issue of people who have been losing their eyesight and five people have died because of their use of uh, unregulated uh, eye drops coming in from uh, overseas. People are dying and people are losing their vision and actually losing their eyeballs. And, and uh, you know, what we want to do is take away the FDA's ability to regulate in this area? Uh, no, I don't think so. Not every member of Congress, especially on this side of the aisle, are willing to give away the health, safety, and well-being of our constituents so that uh, somebody can make a fast dollar. Uh, and with that, I yield back. Would the gentleman yield? I do. Yeah, I would just I, uh, I would just make the gentleman aware that David Koch died a couple of years ago, and so Charles is running what was previously and, known as the Koch brothers. And you the legacy to, continues. You may want to go to a singular rather than a double well, in the future, they, my friend. They both have left gentlemen's, a powerful gentlemen's, legacy. Gentlemen's both time, of them. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, the, the chair recognizes the gentlelady from uh, Indiana. Would the gentlelady yield just ten seconds for unanimous consent? Yes, I yield. Uh, in, in the uh, in the vein of reining in these agencies that are, uh, I think, in so many ways out of control, I would ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter that I sent uh, today to the IRS Commissioner, Mr. Warfall, regarding the situation of an FBI agent knocking on Mr. Taibbi, a journalist door, IRS, yeah, excuse me. Um, I would ask unanimous consent to enter that record in, uh, letter into the record. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excuse me, without objection? Without objection. So ordered. Thank you, Mr. I'm Chairman. Busy handing it to you, Mr. Rankin. <laughs> General Lady's recognized. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually want to concur with Gentle Lady from Wyoming that um, actually EPA probably is the most abusive agencies, and actually Supreme Court rule uh, last year on their complete overreach of their power and authority delegated on the clean. Uh, era Act, and what they're doing with Clean Water Act is actually, you know, it's, I would argue that trying to take private property rights by the government, private property abusing, abusing the power of the government, and when governments try to take your private property, this is actually a communist by Karl Marx. It's not even socialism, and it's very dangerous, and I'll be honest with you, uh, look at the P&Ls and financials of all large corporations and all these big funds like BlackRock, they're doing just fine with all of the regulations that my Democrat colleagues issued. They're making a lot of money. But what is, who is getting hurt is the little guy, that farmer or some business owner that cannot afford to hire lawyers and CPA for $1,000 an hour, that cannot afford to go and lobby to every government level and be and sitting in the offices and trying to make their case. That's who's getting screwed. And we now have a situation now where all of the so-called dark money doing just fine, but the little guy has no ability now to be 
able to start a business and be able to compete and, and, and have a, a, abilities to make money. I think this is a very dangerous situation where we now concentrate in the power close to the government, close to Washington, D.C., and given the power to the bureaucracies that people have no ability to even have an input. I mean, this is crazy, and this is very dangerous for our country. And I will tell you, I mean, EPA is so creative. They do the suicidal gimmicks, you know, to try to put, violate even Administrative Procedures Act. They do all these definitions, you know. They use and they pay people to come into committees you know, and, and lobby on something that doesn't help the people. But in reality, what, that's what's happening with all of these environmental regulations that we put. Because when they're unfeasible, what's happening right now that we're killing, destroying businesses in our country and companies like BlackRock are part of it. They're given a lot of power. They don't have to follow the rules. But what's happening, we're burning coal from China. We're helping Russia to make a lot of money. And American companies are getting screwed. And our pollution is actually has net effect higher than actually that was before. Because when we push our companies to do business in lawless and corrupt countries and dictatorship, they collude in the same environment. We don't build the walls, you know, from China or anywhere else in the same ocean and all pollution goes. Instead of have reasonable yes, laws, yes. the representative of the people and the businesses here and help our people and our companies and, and our Americans to succeed. So this is just dumb. And if you think about it, some of this Funds, you know, that wasn't this, you know, climate change agenda of black rock like British funds that actually there are some activists that are honest and I actually respect if someone is honest, you know, and not hypocrite. If you want to drive everyone a bike and you're driving a bike, I respect you. But if you're flying big jet fuel jets and you want me to ride the bike, well, screw you. You know, you're not going to tell me what to do. You know, this is wrong. You know, you have no power to do that. And, and, and these big companies have no right to tell us what to do. And I think we as legislators, you need to think about it, who we're representing, because these agencies do not represent with the people. They represent big special interest group. People rotate between them. They're getting jobs and lobbying and careers and all of these different companies, and they're promulgating these rules to benefit large special interest groups. And now they are becoming so powerful that everyone is afraid to challenge them. You know, and I think if we are not going to go back and think, what are we doing here? We're going to destroy our our country, how it is known and how it is was set up, and it is very, very dangerous. So our branch has to get our act together and start doing our job and not be afraid of administrative state, not be afraid of large corporation and big money that coming from all directions, but we actually remember that this republic is set up in being the greatest republic in the history of the world for all the reasons. There is no difference between the people because the people have the most power and freedoms. And if we take these freedoms away from with the people, we are going to unfortunately abandon and betray all the people who die for our freedoms. I yield back. <clears throat> Excuse me, the gentlelady yields back. Who seeks recognition on the gentleman from New York's amendment? The gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Moore, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield to my good friend from Wyoming. Thank you. I, I just want to point out that the other irony about this proposed amendment is that the EPA is responsible for one of the worst environmental disasters in the history of the yeah. United States when they blew out the Gold King Mine in southwestern Colorado and turned the Animas River That's orange. True. Just please Google Animus River in orange and you can see the environmental disaster that was created by the EPA that has still not been cleaned up and no one in the EPA has been held responsible or liable for the disaster that was created in August of 2015. Again, the EPA is responsible for one of the, in one of the worst environmental disasters for a waterway in the history of the United States. With that, I yield back. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield to my friend, Mr. Biggs from Arizona. Gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, you know, uh, quite frankly, what you see here today is, is two very different philosophies. And it's really a shame because, as Mr. Roy pointed out earlier, last time the RAINS Act passed, it was a bipartisan issue. Not anymore. Because what you're seeing, quite frankly, is is that our colleagues across the aisle, they just cannot imagine a world without the Leviathan of big government 
uh, kind of regulating every aspect of their life. But with regard to EPA, I just want to point out a, a real homely example from my home state. DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality, is, as, as Ms. Hagman pointed out, it's, it's the state environmental uh, agencies that actually implement the, the imposed federal standards upon them. So one of my favorite stories is, is we were told in Phoenix that we are, you guys are non-attaining, right, because you have too many particulates in, uh, in your air. And we say, okay, what's the particular, what's the biggest problem? By a large margin, you, in a huge city in the desert, what do you think it would be? You got it, dust. We had dust. That's what we had. EPA was there. You got to take care of dust. And what did, what did they tell us to do? We want you to use water to wet down your areas. This is in a city that gets seven inches of rain a year. Five million people live there. You got seven inches of rain, and they want us to water down everything. And so we still have to do that. You're doing a construction site, you're watering it down. You know what, we have, we have I think it was, it's either Google or Facebook putting in a big, uh, they're both putting in big uh, 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 facilities in, my, in my, uh, my district. One of them actually paved their roads for construction because they knew that they would have to waste water to mitigate against the dust. That's the kind of logic you get when you get the experts of the EPA uh, in Washington, D.C., in a cubicle, telling you what you have to do. This, this, this amendment is wrong-headed, and, um, and I think uh, I'm looking forward to us just voting it down. I, and, and with that, I'll yield back to, 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 Mr., I'll yield back to Mr. Moore. Mr. Chairman, I feel like a ping-pong ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll yield to Mr. Ray. Can you believe that? I mean, Roy, I'm sorry. Uh, I think the gentleman from Alabama. The only thing I would add to my friend from Arizona is I think the, the gentleman's aware that a significant number of the rules that we have problems with are coming out of the EPA. It's kind of the whole point. We have the EPA electric vehicle rule with the two thirds EVs by 2023. We have rules uh, regarding power plant rule, 90% emission, 90 emission cuts by 2040. All of these being done unilaterally by an EPA that doesn't give a wit about what that's gonna do to the American people, making massive policy decisions, enormous policy decisions by fiat out of an agency to the president uh, making decisions that are undermining our uh, ability to live freely, but also, frankly, often the environment itself. There was a story just last week how solar farms took over the California desert. An oasis has become a dead sea. There's example after example of how the environmental movement, which is all about moving an agenda, it's not about making sure our environment is healthy and good, it's about moving an agenda. And this agenda is being moved by bureaucrats. The very bureaucrats we're trying to say ought to be checked by the elected representatives. So this amendment is literally the uh, exact wrong direction to go because this is the agency that may uh, present the best case for needing congressional oversight to stop the radical leftist agenda. And I'll yield back to the gentleman from Alabama. Mr. Rule, if I'm correct too, the tax credits in the IRA, 90% of them go to corporations that make more than a billion dollars a year. Correct. And that's part of the negotiations right now, right? Yes, sir. Okay, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Question. The question occurs on the amendment from the gentleman from New York. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Aye. No. Opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from New York. I request the recorded vote. Gentleman requests a recorded vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Issa. No. Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. No. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes no. Mr. Biggs. No. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. No. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy votes no. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Ms. Sparts. Ms. Bartz votes no. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes no. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman. 
Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee votes no. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Fry. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff votes aye. Mr. Cicilline. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Liu. Ms. Jayapal. Mr. Correa. Aye. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Negus. Ms. McBath. Ms. Dean. Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivey. Mr. Ivey votes aye. Gentleman from Florida. Mr. Gates votes no. Ms. Escobar? Yes. Ms. Escobar votes yes. Clerk, uh, clerk, clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are nine ayes and 17 noes. Uh, the amendment is not adopted. M Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Arizona. I have an amendment at the desk. Gentleman, will, uh, clerk will, will uh, report the amendment. Gentleman from Georgia reserves a point of order. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 277. No objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized to, uh, on his amendment. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. David. I am offering this amendment to ensure that the bill captures the totality of agency actions. The American people elected us to legislate. In a time of record inflation and an executive branch that has grown out of control, it is well past time to regain control over the administrative state. Currently, agency rules must go through a full notice and comment process. But agency guidance is not subject to the same requirements. And my simple amendment fixes this loophole. It's, it subjects guidance that has the same effect of the rules and makes it subject to the RAINS Act. It would require that guidance be explicitly included in the definition of a rule under the Congressional Review Act and therefore subject to congressional oversight. It would also require that significant guidance without an economic impact of $100 million or more must go through a full notice and comment process to ensure it then goes into the congressional oversight process. Under the CRA, my amendment would include guidance in the agency reports to Congress and give us an opportunity to act to stop it. If the RAINS Act becomes law, an agency won't be able to implement a major rule or guidance with this amendment without formal approval from the House and Senate. I support the underlying bill. It is an important step, and Representative Klein's bill Ensuring Accountability and Agency Rulemaking Act is another fine bill to reel in the unelected and unaccountable administrative state. We've re Without this amendment, a clever drafter will circumvent the RAINS Act enacting an agenda through neither rulemaking nor congressional statute, as we've seen from this very administration. For instance, with President Biden's student loan cancellation, guidance was treated as binding and used to circumvent public input and avoid congressional oversight. And that had an impact 
of over $600 billion. Guidance allows bureaucrats to bypass Congress entirely. We want to offer families, workers, or small business owners real relief that's going to require a serious effort on our part to stop out of control bureaucrats from regulating and spending away our country's future. The agency guidance has been used too, too long as a bludgeon, a hammer, and it has been exploitable by the bureaucracy. If we're going to rein in the administrative state, this amendment is certainly the way we do it. If we're serious about reestablishing accountability and responsibility, then my colleagues should, should join me by passing this amendment. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Gentleman, <coughs> gentleman yields Mr. back. Chairman, I'll withdraw the point of order. Point of order is withdrawn. Gentlelady, gentlelady from Pennsylvania. Yes, I'd move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Um, it is kind of astonishing, but here we go. This amendment would um, further hamstring the government from completing the tasks that Congress has assigned it to do. So now we're not just talking about actual regulations, we're talking about guidance, which doesn't even have the same authority. It's just incredible overreach by a body which is already struggling to perform its basic functions to now say that nothing else can happen unless Congress were to act. There's a different process here. There's the opportunity for public comment here. Congress certainly can take action if warranted to change a result. Um, but just throwing one more roadblock in terms of uh, the government being able to complete the tasks that Congress has already tasked it with, um, it just really goes to show, once again, that when you have folks who think that government is bad, you get bad government, and that's all this amendment would provide. So I yield back. General Lee yields back. General Lee from Indiana is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually think it's a very good amendment because it's even worse. The guidance is even worse, you know, than everything else because it costs so much money. And think about agencies like FDA. They issue this I guidance and reissue the guidance. It costs billions of dollars, you know, of companies that are doing research. It creates unpredictability. And it costs taxpayers at the end because we all, this it passed on to us a consumer, but also it's stolen innovation. And this guidance has no clear rule how it's issued, no ability to input, it's terrible. The same happened in the Department of Energy with all of the different things, the guidance seems to do for different like nuclear plants. I mean, this stuff is so important, you know, for us to be able to have the predictable set of rules and the rules that express actually the will of Congress and the will of the people. So this is an amendment that I should probably make this bill even more important because guidance is really something that agencies shouldn't even be able to do, but they put such enforcement mechanism on this guidance that it actually costs so much for the economy, for the taxpayer, but also to people's lives in some industry, because sometimes it's life and death situation. And when we stall some of these innovative you know, drugs that may be save people's lives, we actually, you know, we, we, we might be able to not save some people. So this is a significantly important issue. And I appreciate the gentleman bringing this amendment. I, I hope this committee will support it. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Gentlelady from Wyoming is recognized. <clears throat> I want to thank the Congressman from Arizona for bringing what is an extremely important amendment to the RAINS Act. I'm just going to give an example of how guidance is used by the federal regulatory agencies to circumvent the APA and the rights of the American public. In 2019, the USDA issued a two-page fact sheet that they posted to the, uh, to the USDA's website that required all livestock producers in the United States, all cattle and bison producers, to start using RFID, radio frequency identification ear tags, by January 1, 2023, or they would be prohibited from being able to sell their cattle across state lines. This obviously would have a huge impact on a state like Wyoming, which is a large cattle producer, but we don't have uh, packing plants in the state of Wyoming, so all of our cattle is shipped out of state. This was a two-page fact sheet issued on a website without notice, no notice, no comment period. According to the USDA, the price tag of this requirement to the cattle and bison industries would have been $2 billion. That's how these administrative agencies use and abuse guidance 
and it absolutely should be included within this, uh, w within this bill, within the RAINS Act. I again appreciate the inclusion of the word guidance. This is another area where Congress has got to oversee what these agencies are doing and prevent them from being able to abuse their power in the way that they have repeatedly in the past. With that, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Question occurs on the gentleman from Arizona's amendment. Mr. Chairman, um, on the assurance that this is going to be taken up in the Rules Committee, I will withdraw. Gentleman withdraws his amendment. Question. Gentle lady from Pennsylvania is uh, recognized. Okay. You have an amendment? Yes, thank you. Um, I have an amendment at the desk. General, uh, the, uh, the, the clerk will report the amendment. Oh, okay, you have the Reserve one. point of order. So. We're waiting on the amendment. And Thank you. I think we'll stand in recess while we get the amendment. Hey, we're fine. Children. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 277 offered by Ms. Scanlon of Pennsylvania. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, from the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is recognized. The gentleman from Arizona has a point of order. Thank you. So my amendment would make sure that federal agencies would, under this uh, RAINS Act, would still be able to issue rules to lower the incidence of childhood cancer, asthma, and premature mortality. One in four children in my region have childhood asthma largely as a result of environmental factors. And that's why, among other things, the effort to um, repeal the uh, truck emissions regulations that's occurring this week is, is so concerning because that's one of the contributing factors. Um, we also have really important uh, research and treatment facilities, whether Children's Hospital or St. Christopher's Hop Hospital, that um, provide research and data and innovative um, treatments to children in our region. But there's a lot going on in this region. We need the support of the federal regulators to be able to push that research forward to make sure that we're protecting the kids in our region. So, um, you know, we hope our committee can agree here that it's important to protect kids from pollution, from dangerous products, to be able to um, push forward uh, the, the promising new medications that they may be able to take. So, you know, if we're going to gum up the rulemaking process with these burdensome procedural rules, can we at least make sure that we protect children's health? I'd yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. Who seeks recognition? Gentleman from uh, Wisconsin is recognized. Well, I'd, I'm not sure. You know, I think I know what the amendment's trying to do. Um, but was this something that was offered under a previous piece of legislation that may have been drafted in a way that would accomplish what the amendment uh, tries to do right now? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if uh, my colleague had tried to tackle this issue last Congress when they were in control. Um, I, I think it goes back to the, the bigger piece and, and the full bill, which is I've seen the RAINS Act and I've seen it work. And the problem oftentimes can be that even the lawmaker, the legislator, really doesn't do the work up front. They don't draft the legislation in a way that could be clear um, and all inclusive and kind of either lays a path for those agencies that may end up doing the rulemaking and being able to, and what the RAINS Act would do is it allows you to, to put in place some type of scope statement that would actually then go back to the legislature so they could take a look at it and say, this does meet the legislative intent. Would the gentleman yield? This, this, this meets the legislative intent. And if, and if everyone then is on the same page, fine, then move forward with the legislation and ultimately it may pass both houses and be, and be signed into law. But, you know, I don't think we look 
kind of in the mirror on some of this stuff, on, on some of these bills, and say, did you do a good job when you drafted it in the first place? Would the and, gentleman yield? And I think yield? that's part of that this conversation. So, would the gentleman yield for a no, moment? No, I no, I won't yield. I I, I think the the other thing would be, uh, you know, you can have a fiscal trigger too, right? It may not apply to every piece of legislation that makes its way through a through a through the body, through either the House or the Senate. But that's the way it works in some states, and they've had great success. I mean, I think one of the things that's most troubling about what I've been hearing today is that there are a group, some elected officials, I've seen it before, who cozy up to the bureaucracy. They, they, they believe that the answers are all within the bureaucracy, so they cozy up to it. They say, without the bureaucracy, this will not work. And I think that's the opposite view that I take, and I hope that many other elected officials take, is that you should be a skeptic. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't good people in the bureaucracy and people with expertise and people that we rely on on a regular basis when there's a very technical type of legislation, piece of legislation. But, you know, to cozy up to them, that's not your job. That's not why you were elected, to become complicit with the bureaucracy. You're here to work with your colleagues to draft legislation and make sure that what you drafted is ultimately met with the same goals that the rulemaking is, is drawn up on. And, and if we don't have that second kick at the cat, if we don't have that second opportunity to kind of dig into this and say, does this meet kind of the goals that we ultimately set, as a legislative body, <clears throat> um, I don't think we're doing our job. So with that, I, I, I think that, um, you know, my colleague, well-intentioned, I think, in trying to somehow address a very specific issue that obviously would, would pull at the heartstrings of anybody, uh, maybe well-intentioned, but again, I think the overall goal here is to come up with a piece of legislation that holds the bureaucracy accountable. And, and that's why I think the RAINS Act, it's working in states all over this nation. It works great. It really is, a, it's, a, it's a piece of legislation that's been drafted and run through many state houses, and, uh, and it works very well at, at that level. So that's why I think the bill's a good idea, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of uh, the amendment offered uh, by my colleague from Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm proud of her for putting this together. I'm proud of her for um, taking a look at what we're talking about here, the absurdity of what this underlying bill would do and the harm it will cause uh, to the health and safety uh, of all Americans if we go through this, in, this ridiculous um, proposal by the other side uh, around rulemaking, uh, substituting our our thoughts on any of these issues, clean air, clean water, safety of transportation, safety of flight, uh, EPA regulations and the like, uh, and putting that within uh, non-expert hands. Uh, we have experts who are doing cutting edge research uh, on all kinds of areas and specific to this amendment, uh, research on the health and safety of our children, the well-being of our children. Uh, so I rise uh, in support of this. I don't understand how anybody could not support and be a yes on this amendment, uh, offering an exception for the health and safety of our children. And with that, I yield to my colleague, the author of the amendment from Pennsylvania. Thank you. And if the gentleman had been willing to yield, I wanted to express that, you know, I understand his concern about legislation that is drafted without sufficient input when people aren't given the opportunity to help make a bill better, as we've been seeing repeatedly throughout this Congress, um, so that there are gaps in what is put, sent to the floor, what is sent to the agencies. But instead of um, trying to block agency action that might fill in some of these gaps appropriately, uh, this bill would block agency action and force things back to Congress um, 
rather than forcing Congress to do the job right in the first time. So I share the, con I share the congressman's concern about uh, Congress legislating well in the first instance, um, but hamstringing the entire federal government when Congress is not doing its best work, I think punishes all of America, and I don't think that's the appropriate response. So I yield back to my colleague, Ms. Dean. And I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. The, the, the gentle, gentle ladies from Pennsylvania yield back. The gentle lady from uh, Indiana is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I've put a kind of couple few things I have come listening to this debate. First of all, I think it's absurdity to think that somehow the people that sit in these offices in Washington, D.C., that a lot of this agency that never had a job in the real world, they know better than the American people on the ground and actually doing the work. And the only input that the American people do have that actually through us, through legislative branch. So this actually, you know, our responsibility and duty to do that. And um, I think this bill doesn't do anything except it just says, you know, we have a big overreach right now by administrative state. And we as in Congress needs to do our job. And maybe some people don't like it. Well, you know what? You don't have to run for office if you don't want to do your job. You know, I, but if you ran for this office to represent these people, you should not be afraid to spend some time legislating creating policies that represent the people. And I, to tell you the truth, sometimes actually it does disservice because regulations, it is a long process and goes through a lot of drama. If something is very good and something is really important for children or fight cancer or something, actually Congress has a good ability maybe to do it faster because if we can agree and have consensus, we can put bills in suspension and pass so quickly if it's good for the people. So actually agencies and bureaucracy are stolen a lot of innovation that would be so good for the Americans. And that is the biggest problem we are facing right now is expensive. A lot of people cannot even bring innovation because you have to hire so many so-called attorneys and PhD and experts that charge a bunch of fees that a lot of them have no idea what's going on in the real world. But if you don't have a lot of money to bring your innovation or invention, you know, if you're not able to do it, if you're a startup company, you have no ability to do it. That's why only big companies now are getting bigger. And we have, you know, we're always fighting too large to fail. Our too large to fail is even bigger now. Like in every industry, we're, we're getting such an oligopolis everywhere that we're going to be in trouble soon because they have controlled so much of the market. So I think it's actually very positive would be for us and for innovation and for actually for children and fight a lot of diseases and everything if Congress would do its job and actually does some of this, you know, promulgate this, you know, uh, legislation correctly, plus probably more on a narrow basis. We shouldn't give so much, you know, power and broad authority to the other branch. You know, we have to think what our laws are doing. We have to spend time things how they're implementing and adjusting them. That is part of effective legislative process. We also need to think what federal government should be doing and what states and locals should be doing because unfortunately, federal government somehow thinks we're so superior here to everyone else. We're accumulating so much power that our core functions, the protecting constitutional rights, securing our border, having strong military and national defense, we're not doing the greatest job on that because we're stretched to things. We're doing a lot of things that States are closer to the people. It would be much more effective doing that. And I think Congress maybe start thinking, oh my gosh, I have to vote on this, all these things. Maybe, I, maybe that is not a job that we should be even doing here. And we're overreaching what we're doing as a branch. And I think that will make us think twice and the legislators here. So I think it's a very good legislation. It's unfortunate that we cannot come to bipartisan consensus. And we should be able to oversee the other branch regardless who is in charge. Democrat or Republican, it should not matter. We are co-equal branch of government and actually probably the most powerful from co-equal because we have power of the person, power of the war, and founding fathers wanted us to be like that. So when we are not doing our job, we're doing disservice to this republic and to, our, to the American people, and I think we need to think about that. So all this bill does, it tells Congress, you know, don't subrogate your powers, 
do your job, legislate for people, and let the American people have an input. Let, it doesn't matter, because this is a country that it doesn't matter where you're born, rich or poor, where you came from, it doesn't matter. Your rights are equally protected. And constitutional republic is very important where you don't have a tyranny of majority, but you have ability to protect rights of a minority. And that is the most important function we have. But if we allow other branch to legislate on our behalf and promulgate laws on our behalf and, and decide about people's rights, we are betraying our republic and our constitutional values. So hopefully we could have a consensus. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? Gentleman, oh, let's go first to Mr. Uh, gentleman from Arizona to with Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I need you uh, first to withdraw your point of order. Oh, yes, I withdraw the point of order. Gentleman withdraws his point of order. Gentleman's recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, there's been an illusion that the RAINS Act will be hamstringing the federal government. So I think that, I think the problem here is fundamentally, again, it gets to, again, the distinction of the worldview. Um, but overall, the Democrats' point of view seems to be that administrative agencies under a RAINS Act application will not promulgate any rules and not be able to promulgate any rules. Well, even if the, even ones like are being offered in this amendment that are viewed as being, being righteous and important. Um, and so they're, they're worried that, that, that if the RAINS Act goes into effect, you, you just won't have any administrative uh, rules. They're not, but that's, that's simply not the case. The, the reality is administrative agencies will continue to promulgate rules. The only thing being that certain of those rules are gonna be brought back before the legislative body for approval. That is to say, the people's representatives will have the final say on specific certain rules promulgated by agencies. And so you don't need to do special exemptions and, and carve outs because if that rule has an impact defined by the RAINS Act, it will, come, it will come here. And this notion that somehow um, we are incapable of listening to input from the agency or those upon whom the agency relied as they promulgated a proposed rule just doesn't seem to wash. So uh, for me, uh, this, this amendment is superfluous, it's not necessary. And it, and it gets to this crazy presumption, uh, you know, the, the, the premise that the Democrats have, um, which is unfortunate because it wasn't too many years ago that this was a bipartisan issue and passed out of here, uh, bipartisanship. And with that, I'll yield to the gentleman from New Jersey if you want some time. Thank you, my friend. Um, very quickly, I'll tell you what the purpose of this amendment is. Uh, and I don't mean to be mean-spirited. The purpose of the amendment is to make Republicans look bad. The purpose of the amendment is to literally say that we don't care about little sick children and that we don't care about their health. That's an absurd notion. All this bill requires is Congress to affirmatively approve major rules. If there's a good major rule that's going to help sick children and it's done appropriately, we're obviously going to approve it. No more, no less. But we want to make sure that it's done right. No Congress, no Republican congressman is going to say we're against helping sick babies. Come on. Uh, let's, let's be real. And uh, I would encourage my colleagues not to vote for this. I yield back. And I'll yield back to the gentleman. The yields back. The gentleman from New York is recognized. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'll be very brief. The purpose of this amendment is not to make Republicans look bad. The entire bill makes Republicans look bad, terrible in fact, because the entire bill would uh, eliminate the ability to protect the air and the water and, and, and the safety of airplanes and the safety of cars and the safety of trains and everything else. Uh, this bill would endanger uh, 
every citizen of the every person living in the United States. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Wow. So this is great. Thank you for the setup, Mr. Ranking Member. Um, to 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 have Congress make the laws to protect us from calamity would be a catastrophe for the American people. And look, there are a lot of people out there that say the way Congress operates, that seems to be true because Congress is frustrating. It's meant to be frustrating in its design. But remember what Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government ever conceived except for all of the others. I, I, the, 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 I'll offer my own suggestion about the purpose of the amendment. Purpose of the, amendment. the issue has already been vetted in the last amendment. But I guess the Democrats are offering a series of amendments to pick out things that they would say, they want you to take a specific example and say, with this, wouldn't you want the agency to be able to act? Well, and here's the, here's the problem with that. It is affected by careless, utopian thinking. Let me tell you why. I'll bet nobody's actually read the language of the proposed amendment and thought about what it covers. It is the gas stove ban exemption. It's the gas stove ban exemption. Let me read the part I'm talking about because somebody mentioned childhood cancer. Okay, here's the language. I'm going to read the whole effective language. The term special rule. So these would be a special rule would be exempted from the purview of Congress. It means any rule promulgated that would result, link about those words a minute, would result in children experiencing a reduced incidence Think about that one, too. Of cancer, premature mortality, very bad things, asthma attacks, or respiratory disease. What have we heard of late <coughs> by those who want to ban gas stoves? Well, they say that the air in houses with gas stoves is dangerous or is harmful in some way. It just happens to be the case that the same people are among the same supporters are the lunatics who want to completely eradicate fossil fuel use. That might be motivating them, but they don't want to admit it. So the rule you want to admit, or the rule you want to exempt from Congress looking at it, you wouldn't want the technicians and the experts, because we definitely need to defer to them, who say that gas stoves have been in use in American households for a century or two, a century at least, uh, need to be eliminated because they might have some ameliorative effect, reduce the incidence of asthma attacks or respiratory disease in some small group of people at some point in time. Look, if it's true, if it's true that, those, that that will happen, the experts can walk right up here, sit at just those tables in the right committee, and tell Congress, we have a magical answer to asthma and respiratory disease. Just ban gas stoves from Americans' homes. And Congress could say, oh my, why haven't we thought of that? That's a great idea. Americans will be delighted to have their gas stoves ripped out of their homes because of the fear of an asthma attack for little Johnny. Or Congress could say, thank you for your advice, we believe that you are insane. And the American people would throw us out of office if we ban their gas stoves from their homes. That could be another, another one. So the bill contains categorical ca carve-outs. It allows the President of the United States for a single, if there's an emergency, if, if somebody comes out with the cure to childhood cancer, if a bureaucrat just by the stroke of a pen can cure childhood cancer, Wipe it out, because of some, you know, 150 words in a reg, the President of the United States could issue an order for 90 days, because that, we can't wait for that, 90 days. And in 90 days, certainly all, cured, all childhood cancer would be cured, and at that point, what Congress ever would not adopt that as into law? I think Congress would. This is silliness. The, 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 I'm listening to the most acerbic terms from the minority that we would ask Congress to make our laws. 
from the, from the architects of the preservation of our democracy. Wow. Good luck to our democracy. My time's expired. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And after serving in our state legislature in Florida, now here in the Congress, I've come to learn that the more I see of government, the less of it I want. And that seems to be the reaction increasingly of our constituents who face woke and weaponized agencies with seemingly unlimited authority to be able to impact regulatory costs. And I've heard the minority debate against the underlying RAINS Act and for these various carve-outs in terms that would scare people. We wouldn't be able to make decisions. Our process would be frozen. Chaos would ensue. I'm here to tell you we have test cases that empirically prove that to be false. The very first piece of legislation I passed in the state legislature was the Florida version of the RAINS Act. It said that if regulatory costs were at a certain level, the agency could be compelled to produce a lower cost regulatory alternative. And they would have to defend that, and if they could not, then that particular regulatory action would not have the force of law. And all of the things that my, my colleagues in the minority have been saying did not happen. Why? Because if agencies have to defend their conduct, there is a deterrent effect against inappropriate agency action. In the Florida legislature, we actually meet a lot less than here in the United States Congress. And they haven't had to review hundreds or thousands of, of these regulations that exceed the authority. In, in those circumstances, the legislature, I think, has put the right constraint on the administrative state so that everyone could say, stay in their lanes. And so it, if the animation does not come from a sincere desire to save us from chaos, then why would the minority in this case not want the politically elected representatives of the people to be the lawmakers. And I think the real reason is that they want to divorce the painful decisions that bureaucrats make from political accountability. Because regular folks don't get to go vote against somebody with green eye shades in a windowless cubicle at the IRS building. They vote for or against their representatives in a republic. And so that's what this is really all about, being able to ensure that where people feel pain in terms of complying with laws, so these are the people who want to comply and feel an economic pain as a consequence, and where the agency cannot produce a lower cost regulatory alternative, we think the obligation should be on the Congress. And that is, I think, the better representation of good governance. That's certainly been our experience in Florida. And if there is a state, that has done what mine has and has adopted a state level version of this to constrain their state government and it has resulted in the hysteria that we hear from the minority, I look forward to hearing that, that case study. Seeing none of my colleagues that seek for the time, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. The question occurs on the amendment from the gentlelady from Pennsylvania. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Aye. No. Opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Roll call being uh, requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Issa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Mr. Gates. No. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. No. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes no. Mr. Biggs. No. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes no. Ms. Sparks. Ms. Sparks votes no. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes no. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels. Mr. Nels votes no. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman. Mr. Moran. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee votes no. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Fry. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff votes aye. Mr. Cicilline. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Liu, 
Ms. Jayapal, Mr. Correa, Ms. Scanlon, Ms. Scanlon votes aye, Mr. Nagoose, Ms. McBath, Ms. Dean, Ms. Dean votes aye, Ms. Escobar, Ms. Ross, Ms. Ross votes aye, Ms. Bush, Mr. Ivey, Mr. McClintock votes no. All members voted. Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are five ayes and 15 noes. Uh, and, uh, the uh, amendment is not agreed to. The gentle, uh, gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized for an amendment. Mr. Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report. Amendment to the amendment. Order, in the order reserved by the gentleman from uh, Florida. To HR 277, offered Without by objection, Mr. the amendment will be considered as read. The gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized as, uh, on her amendment. Thank you. Once more into the breach. Uh, like the other amendments my colleagues have offered today, this amendment would exempt the Food and Drug Administration from the RAINS Act so the knowledgeable career public services servants at the FDA can continue their work to keep our food and medicine safe. I'm curious who amongst my colleagues wants to venture that they know enough to, about food safety or chemistry to opine on what drugs should be approved or what food can be sold at our supermarkets. I'm not sure that a bunch of lawyers or um, politicians are the right people to be making the granular decisions about those products. And I bet the Amer majority of Americans would agree that these decisions should be made by people with actual expertise and not politicians. And with that, I'd yield back. General uh, woman yields back. Gentleman from Florida with, withdraws his point of order. Who seeks recognition? Gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just argue, as we have against all these other amendments, that this in no way infringes, inhibits the ability of these regulators to uh, make recommendations about the safety of our food or the safety of our water, but ultimately leaves the decision to the representatives of the people. And I would argue that uh, uh, restoring Article I authority is, is something that our constituents would support. Uh, having a greater say in the way that their bureaucracy operates is uh, something that uh, we should strive for. So I would urge my colleagues to defeat this amendment, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Question, a gentleman from uh, New York is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'll be very brief. I will simply reassert what we've said on some of the other amendments and what Ms. Scanlon has said. Uh, we're talking here about the Food and Drug Administration. It does not, the Congress does not have the expertise to decide which foods are safe, what f additives to food are safe, uh, what drugs are safe. We delegate that to an agency with expertise that can actually uh, uh, make such judgments. If we disagree with them, we have the CRA, and uh, uh, that's why I, uh, I support the amendment, and I would oppose the bill. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. I oppose this amendment. Co Congress is capable of considering and approving agency rules. We're not saying the agencies can't have a say in it. The FDA can make a recommendation, but ultimately, we are accountable to the people let me give you an example of, of something the FDA has just done recently. This will kick in in two weeks. Um, if you go to your farm supply store, it now says over-the-counter livestock antibiotics will require veterinary prescription starting June 11th, 2023. That was an FDA edict. They just came up with it on their own. For as long as antibiotics have existed, farmers could go buy antibiotics at the farm supply store. The FDA has now just put this huge regulation on small farmers. It's going to be, I mean, and a lot of people don't realize the FDA has anything to do with day-to-day uh, -day farm management, but they do. What this will do is it's another one of those examples of scale prejudicial regulation. Every giant corporate farm has got a veterinarian right there on staff. But most small farmers, you call a veterinarian, you can't get one to come out. They are uh, overworked, and there aren't enough of them. 
And so this is an example, this is a prime example of a regulation that the FDA put in place when they came out and just unilaterally said on June 11th, 2023, you can, if you're a farmer, you can't treat your own animals with an antibiotic. And it's not just about antibiotics, they call them antimicrobials. So they're gonna expand this eventually to just about anything you need. Now here's what's gonna happen, animals will go untreated for diseases. Is this gonna make us safer? To make it harder to treat your own animals for disease? No, but the FDA promulgated this rule and the FDA is the one responsible for it, although I would argue under our system of government, we should be responsible for it. That's what the overall bill, the RAINS Act does. And if you exempt the FDA from the RAINS Act, this is the kind of nonsense you're gonna get. Is there anybody here? Would anybody here say we shouldn't vote on whether farmers can get antibiotics or not? Are we, is our whole body, the 435 of us, so stupid that we can't go get the information, we can't go talk to our farmers, we can't go talk to our veterinarians, we can't go talk to people in our district and find out whether this is a good rule or not? Does the gentleman yield, want a response? I would love a response. Do you think Congress should be able to say whether farmers are able to treat their animals or not? Well, I think certainly that, that Congress can do that, but when Congress can't even raise the debt ceiling, to pay the country's bills, I think there's a lack of capacity. Yeah, three weeks. Reclaiming my time, I voted to raise the debt ceiling, and the gentle lady hasn't, as far as I can tell, this Congress. Yeah. Uh, so, and if we're if we can be as if we can be responsible for something like the debt limit on our side of the aisle, then we can decide, and we should decide whether farmers have access to common drugs to treat their animals, and order to prevent the spread of disease. This is, this is crazy, but this is one of those FDA rules that's kicking in on June 11th, 2023. It's an example of why we need the RAINS Act, and it's an example of why this is a bad amendment. I urge a no vote on the amendment and a yes vote on the RAINS Act, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back, who seeks recognition. Question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from Pennsylvania. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Request, no? Okay. Question now occurs on the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Uh, all those in favor of uh, the amendment in the nature of the substitute will say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. no? No. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment in the nature of a substitute is agreed to. Question now occurs, uh, recording, uh, reporting quorum being present, the question is on favorably reporting the bill as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the bill's ordered Mr. reported. Chairman. Gentleman from New York uh, request a uh, recorded vote. Clerk will call the roll on the uh, final passage. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Isa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs. Aye. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock. Aye. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Roy. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparts. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Nels. Mr. Nels votes yes. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes aye. Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes aye. Ms. Hageman. Mr. Moran. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee votes aye. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Fry. Mr. Nadler. No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren. Ms. Jackson Lee, Mr. Cohen, Mr. Johnson of Georgia, Mr. Schiff, no. Mr. Schiff votes no, Mr. Cicilline, Mr. Swalwell, Mr. Liu, Ms. Jayapal, Mr. Correa, 
Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Mr. Nagus? Ms. McBath? Ms. Dean? Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Escobar? Ms. Ross? Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Bush? Mr. Ivey? Mr. Bishop, you're not recorded. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Any members uh, who wish to vote who haven't, the clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 13 ayes and five noes. The ayes have it and the bill is ordered to be reported favor to the House. Members will have two days to submit views. Without objection, the bill will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute incorporating all adopted amendments and staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. Pursuant to notice, I call up H.R. 357, the 